So having seen the church's message and the messengers in chapter number one, we're going to look at the church's conduct in chapter two. Now, as we go through chapter 2, it's not going to be a straight line, if you will, of information given. But I do hope that we will cover all of the content in verses 1 through 10 today. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Titus chapter number 2 as we share God's Word together. If uh, this is your first time with us or one of a few times, my name is Greg I have the privilege of being the pastor here. Uh, we read publicly, uh, usually, from the ESV version. We've had some say, hey, what Bible are you reading from? It's the English Standard Version. Uh, so that is the text that we'll be uh, reading from. But feel free to join us in whatever translation you use. Titus chapter 2, verse number 1. But as for you, this is Paul speaking to his understudy, Titus. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself, Titus a young man, in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Verse 9. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. As to the individual conduct now of the members of the church, Paul gave Titus some clear instructions here in at least four areas. You may find more than these four. That's fine if you do. Today we're going to look at these four. Number one, he was to teach soundness and self-control. That's through the whole ten verses. Second, he was to teach Men, older men and younger men. Titus, as the pastor, was to teach servants. And he was also, even as a man, to teach women, particularly the elderly women in the church, who would then pass that on to the younger women. So first today, we're looking at the content of teaching. It was to be delivered with sound doctrine coupled with a behavior that is marked by self-control. Now the words sound and self-control, they're all over these 10 verses. And the word sound leans very heavily into having good or balanced health. And when you have good health or you have a balanced health, that allows a holistic function with all of the individual parts working together. So the complete catalog of teaching is to be looked at here. And as with most things in life, and this is a, a principle to consider and live by, the sum, the complete, comp the complete thing, if you will, is greater than any of the individual parts. Okay, So the complete catalog of teaching does not become disabled over maybe a troubling teaching. When we have a troubling teaching, we should not abandon or forsake the whole of the body of doctrine that God gives us in his word. But we need to work through those difficulties because there is a fitness of teaching that is formed when we look from a wide-angled lens. Healthy doctrine develops healthy disciples. Let's say that together. Healthy doctrine 
develops healthy disciples. So Paul knows this, that the sound, healthy doctrine of verse number one encourages a sound, healthy faith in verse number two, which leads to sound, healthy speech in verse number eight. So all the proper conduct within the church, it flows from the character traits that are built upon true, uncorrupted instruction. Because your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And we know that to be true. Soundness. And self-control are to be taught to men. I know it's Mother's Day, but we're going to preach as men too a little bit here, okay? Older men and younger men. Now, it's up to you where you fall in that classification. I'm not going to designate who's older, who's younger. Not with men and definitely not when we get to the ladies passage, all right? I know some of you ladies in our church software, uh, it it says you're 120 years old because you won't give us the real birth year that you were born. So Paul says, look, you're to pattern yourself in this way so that nothing evil can be said about the church. I think it's pretty easy and safe to say that protests that we hear from opponents of our faith are mostly because of interactions that people have had with churches and people in churches. Every now and then, and I don't have too often, we run into somebody who has something bad to say about God, okay? But you will run into many people who have plenty to say about those who claim to have represented God to them. And that's me, and that's you, And that's why Paul says our conduct is to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, sound in love, steadfastness. Young men, be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, teaching, showing integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So you got to have sound teaching that brings a sound faith that creates sound speech. So these admonitions of Paul urge us to do better as we do inventory in our lives. So soundness and self-control is for the older men, the younger men. It's also for the servants. Some in your translations will find the word slaves. Paul is addressing what the Greek word doulos is, referring to a bond servant or a slave. And in the early church in the first century, this was still being practiced along uh, parts of Europe, northern Africa, the known world, if you will. And those servants who had believed on Christ and did not hold ownership to their own person, they were slaves who served their masters. So he urges them to submit to and obey their overseers. And while there's no direct mention of the masters of Crete in Titus, we do know that in his letters to Ephesus and to Colossae, Paul gave command to the masters and he implores the masters to behave well towards their slaves. And this position of due loss It's used with an honor and a high dignity in the New Testament because it really speaks to us as believers who are willing to live under the leadership of our master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So it's the way we are to model ourselves in that. So we've talked about the older men and the younger men. We've talked about the servants. We've talked about doctrine. So now on Mother's Day, we're going to move into the section of Scripture that deals with the older and the younger women. So before I proceed, me along with many other pastors, I can tell you uh, that we're often charged with the claim that we're very soft on Mother's Day 
and very hard on Father's Day. It's like, what the ladies, we love you, we appreciate you. And then it comes to Father's Day, man, you got to get right with God. You got to start living better, you know. And this is true because why? Because most pastoral figures are male. And I think me and others, we readily, yeah, guys, go ahead and start passing those out. We readily recognize our insufficiency as men to provide complete empathy towards women because we are obviously different, okay? So right now, before we approach these guidelines, which might be difficult for some to swallow, especially coming from a man, I wanna make sure we give you something sweet, okay? <laughs> so, so there are several men who are walking around the building today in the crowd. And if you are a mother in any respect, okay, uh, I know uh, uh, some are mothers by natural birth, some are mothers uh, by adoption, some are mothers just to their nieces and nephews. And the, However you are a mother, uh, we want to honor you today. So please take a Snickers bar or a Reese's. You, you're not getting any generic chocolate here at Fellowship, all right? You're getting... <laughs> You're getting two of the best. You're getting Snickers. So if any of you are feeling Betty Whitish, get a bite of that now. Make it power through till lunch, amen. And Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, yeah, we've been listening to your stomach and uh, we know what you want, amen. You can enjoy these at your leisure or if I say something that is somewhat bitter this morning, just take a bite of the chocolate to help wash it down, Amen. As those guys continue passing out uh, these uh, Snicker bars and Reese's, if you are a mother and you can stand, uh, we would like to give you the respect and the honor that you have earned today. Would you please stand? Amen. <clears throat> Every person alive on planet earth today has a mother. And we are thankful for you today. Soundness and self-control was not just to be taught to men. It was also to be taught to the women. See, Christianity over the last two millennia, has done more than any other belief system in the whole wide world to elevate women to an equal standing with men. It really, really has. And this idea of an equal standing should not be confusing or disturbing to us because we serve a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead are co-equal, okay? Men and women, no doubt about equality. Now, with the equality comes responsibility. So soundness and self-control is also taught to the older and the younger women. Women, They're the pattern themselves in a way that nothing evil could be said about them being part of the church. Now, we are somewhat off-put by the suggestion or the practice of piety today. Uh, I think it was a lot more popular uh, in, our, in our nation uh, to practice piety, to live quiet and meek and things like that uh, many hundreds of years ago. And today, a quaint or a quiet life is sometimes frowned upon and looked at as a boring existence. And I, there's no doubt that the hypocrisy of pseudo-piety has numbed some of us to the pursuit of holiness, okay? So we've seen some be very hypocritical with their piety or their practice of holiness. But just because, okay, I heard this this weekend, just because someone plays Beethoven badly, you don't blame Beethoven. And just because someone might fail at obeying the scriptures and being what God commands us to be, don't blame that on God. And don't blame it on the church. 
We're all just trying. We're all just, you know, we're trying to do this together. And some of us mess up. And that's why we're big on forgiveness. Because God is. We're big on love. So I would like to propose to you that a life dedicated to God and incorporates modesty, it doesn't have to be mundane because conducting ourselves in accordance with Scripture can be both thoughtful and meaningful. So Paul encourages Titus, a man, a young man, to teach the elderly women in his congregation to be thoughtful. Now, I certainly hope that no one views a male pastoral figure giving a Bible message as mansplaining. All right? It's not what we're trying to do. But the apostle is asking women, and the pastor often asks the women, the teachers, to be aware of themselves and incorporate a life that is pleasing to God himself. Because a life that's pleasing to God, it shines bright and it shines far. The older women were implored to conduct themselves in a fashion that was no doubt out of step with the elderly women of the general population of Crete. Living for God in any generation, whether you're man, male, or female, it always has been and always will be in conflict with popular cultural tendencies. People say, oh, it's hard to live for God in 2022. You know when else it was hard to live for God? 22. It was hard to live for God in 2022 B.C. It's always been a task, a mantle to carry, a burden to bear. What did Jesus say? Take up your cross, follow me. In verse 3, Paul inserted the word likewise, because these requests were very similar to what he'd already asked the men to do. And the women who were the, also the temple of the Holy Spirit, again, raising the level of women to equality with men, they were to be suited with sacredness in their lifestyle. They were not to be slanderers. The Greek word for slanderer here is quite interesting. It is diabolos. Diabolos, Diablo, devil. Let's go to the next slide. Wow. Don't be slanderous. Don't be devilish. Think of that the next time you hurl a gossipy gesture or you pass on an unverified accusation or you just flat out lie about someone. Think about the word diablos before you share that post or pass on that unverified article on your social media. Well, I believe it was on Facebook. That's mistake number one. Your fifth grade teacher would tell you, do some research. And do you know that the politician that you oppose, the celebrity that you disdain, and the athlete that you despise, they're human beings, and they have feelings, and they have a family just like you do, just like I do. We sometimes feel like those who are in the spotlight live in some other world who is un, and they're untouched by slanderous words. Well, they may not see my post or your, your post themselves. They may not see the slander we slather on social media, but others do. So don't slander others in the same way that the devil accuses you and me night and day before God. Don't be devilish in your talk. Drunkenness was obviously an issue in Crete. I'm like, man, is this Crete or Barbersville? I don't know, what is it? I mean, it's a, it's a problem in a lot of places. L.A., New York, honey. I mean, man, 
Brisbane, Australia. I, mean, I don't care where you go. Drunkenness is an issue. And it's, it's sad that far too many who dabble in drink fail to practice temperance. Instead of controlling their consumption of alcohol, it is indeed the beer, the liquor, and the wine that takes the reins and works ruin in clarity of thought, balance of movements, and physical well-being. The older women are here warned not to drown their sorrows in wine because they have a deeper and a more satisfying well from which to drink. That's God, Christ. He's the well. Isaiah 55, verse 1 if you are thirsty, come and drink water. If you don't have any money, come, eat what you want, drink wine and milk without paying a cent. Why waste your money on what really isn't food? Why work hard for something that doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and you will enjoy the very best foods. Verse 6, turn to the Lord. He can still be found. Can I get a witness in that? Oh, man. He is near. If you've been looking for the Lord, he's been looking for you. And I don't know if you're going any closer than today to get things right. Give up your evil ways and your evil thoughts. Return to the Lord our God. He will be merciful and forgive our sins. Amen. The older women, the mothers, if you will, uh, that were in the church, at uh, Crete, they were to lead a life that was classified as attractively good. They were to conduct themselves in a manner which would glorify God and instill discipline in others, primarily to the younger ladies or mothers. And this, the positive traits that Paul was instructing Titus to give to the ladies were to far outweigh the negative and provide a life for the ladies of peace and prosperity peace and prosperity who doesn't want that kind of life who doesn't want a life that would be peaceful and prosperous with an outflow of attractive goodness that's passed on to others I mean you just have to be insane to not want peace and prosperity in your life and this is what God always presents to his people and I'm so grateful for the amazing ladies here at Fellowship who've been living such a way for such a long period of time and they're providing a very positive model for young ladies to follow. On Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., we have a ladies group called Girls of Grace. It's a huge part of that process. And I want to thank you, Diana Grounds, for leading that group and all of you ladies who attend those sessions. If you attend Girls of Grace, just real quick, I'm going to have you do some more exercise. Probably good for the blood to flow a little bit. Go ahead and stand up if you attend the Girls of Grace. Ladies, stand up. Amen. Keep standing. Remain standing, please. Okay, just remain standing. Those of you who are seated, if you... Stay up, Jeanette. The, those of you who are seated, please look at these ladies. And if you want to get connected to some ladies, you can ask them whether they consider themselves older or younger. It's up to them. Again, get, if you want to get connected to a, a really great group to learn some of these things from other ladies, Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. Thank you, ladies. You may be seated. Amen. In verse 4, such an attractively good life was obviously to be modeled by love. Here's the Bible's hashtag model status for all women. Ladies, love your husbands, love your children. Isn't that good? Love is a very godly attribute. It's a, it's a great thing to do. You, you want to be like God, you want to be like Jesus, love people. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave. Now, here's the deal. Pastor, my husband's lazy. What should I do? Love him. Hus uh, Pastor, my husband, he works too much. He's gone all the time. What should I do? Love him. This is one. Pastor, my husband isn't saved. 
He doesn't know the Lord. What should I do? Love him. My husband's awesome. I don't get that a lot, but <laughs> if he's awesome, just keep loving him and his awesomeness. Amen. My kids are unruly. What should I do? Love them. My kids are great. I hear that a lot. Keep loving them. There are no preconditions to the love God commands us to practice. Verse 5, he shares what kind of love, what love looks like on a daily basis. Be self-controlled. That is, train yourself to be sensible. It reflects living in a God-defined Balance. Don't let yourself get out of kilter. And no matter if we're male or female, we should press ourselves into the life definition that God has prescribed for us in his word. He tells them to be pure. Jesus has washed you on the inside, ladies. Hallelujah. He's washed you white as snow with his precious blood so that you can live clean on the outside. So don't let the filthiness of others who are on the outside contaminate your elegance in Christ. Christ Jesus has made you elegant on the inside and wants you to display elegance on the outside. He says, all right, be working at home. The, the, lady, the mothers in Crete were probably busy bodies getting involved in outside activities that serve little or no benefit to their homes. Now, before the pandemic, right, a couple years ago, telling uh, this idea of women working at home, well, boy, that could get you in trouble. Now, what's everybody want to do? I'm just going to work from home. <laughs> well, amen, that sounds good to me. I remember during the pandemic, I called this one agency and there was a representative. She said, oh, forgive me, you might hear the children in the background. I said, I think it's great. I think it's great. If you're a boss out there, if you have employees, I'm not telling you how or do whatever you know you want, but be considerate uh, to your employees. And really, I think working at home for a young mother or any member of the family, it's probably more about, and don't miss this, intention than it is location. That is, no matter, ladies, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you're protecting your own home and the interests therein. You're not a busybody in a bunch of meaningless matters that bear no interest in your own domestic framework you remember the word for slander diablos well what do you think the root word for kind is when he admonishes the ladies to be kind can you guess if slander is diablos what would be the root word for kind if slander is the devil what's kind God the word is agathos containing theos. It's an amazing contrast I think the Apostle Paul is wielding here as this letter is being written. And ladies, let me ask you, who would you rather be styling for and profiling for? Diablos or theos? No doubt, it's God. And this kindness that Paul describes, it's from a stem that is attached to to the roots of righteousness. And he says, I want you to follow what is intrinsically good. And the intrinsically good does come into the next landmine that I'm going to step in. Teach women to be submissive to their own husbands. Gosh. This is the one that some brides are like, I don't even want this included in my wedding vows. Now, I will say this. Just like every other admonition, it's dependent upon the individual choosing to adhere to the counsel or not. I haven't heard anybody, any candy, wrapper bar, candy bar wrapper, so I guess I'm okay right now. To be submissive, it's a voluntary act of the will and one that is encouraged for the young ladies. 
just as we all possess different personalities and we have very varied styles of how we do our relationship, don't miss this. The relational submission that is, can't, that is commanded by Scripture, I'm going to tell you this right now. It's one that you're just going to have to work out in honesty between the husband and the wife. Okay? Now, when we think about this, this idea of equality and responsibility, remember we talked about God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal. The Father and the Son are equal. Son and the Spirit, equal. But the Son, he submitted to the will of the Father. Didn't mean Jesus isn't God anymore. Doesn't mean he's any less God. He's still the mighty God. He's our Savior. We sing to him every day. But he submitted to the will of the Father in their equality. And the Spirit, he submits to the Father and the Son. So it doesn't mean they're any less. It just means they're different tasks. And I'm going to say this right now. It's been my personal observation that a husband who demands submission from his wife is not deserving of submission. Amen. If a man's leading and loving the way that he should, I, most women that I've talked to, they like that safety. But a woman who review, refuses to submit to her husband, she's not enjoying the built-in safety net of marriage. And if you can't work this biblical mandate out together, you would be well suited to connect with someone who could help walk you through this biblical assignment together. Because the ideas given to be followed are so that the Bible says the word of God would not be reviled. So when we, as God's chosen people, fail to follow his commands and refuse to acknowledge them as good and worthy of respect, we blaspheme our beliefs, and this reverses moral values. When we're out of whack, we open ourselves up to attack. Learn what is good. Be faithful to the Lord. Protect your marriage and your home. Stay by the stuff. And mom, great is your reward when you do these things. Three quick things to finish up with. Number one, it's all about maturing. We grow at different speeds. We grow to different statures. We're all in process together. However... Some of us think that we've matured, but we've only gotten older. A growing old does not guarantee that any maturing has even occurred. Number two, good behavior should be celebrated, not disdained, not looked upon as boring or nerdy or dumb or stupid. I can't believe it should be celebrated. And bad behavior should be suppressed.